in that mode, I realized I don't have friends. And I was like, okay, I can, I can deal with that. And then I was like, why don't I have friends? Well, I don't say hello. And so then I was at dad's, oh, there was always dads at the park and I wanted to say hello, but I was like, you know what? They just want to have a long day. Like I did. They just want to play with the kids. They don't want to talk. And then one day I just said, screw it. I'm going to say hello. And we were adult, both just playing chicken. And we turned out that both of us wanted to talk. We just needed someone to go first. And repeating that over and over just taught me how good it felt hearing new perspectives. We're always one hello away from a completely different life. Uh, my friend Ben, uh, let Feel Good Fathers know what that means. It means this idea of basic hello is this universal word that we're all taught, but the power of it is never actually taught to us of how this is actually the one word that could yield a completely different life, that there are people that live completely different than we do, that see the world differently than we do. And we are always one hello away from exposing ourselves to that way of life that then can allow us to see our life wider. I always say we're missing two things in our life. We don't have enough width to the American dream and we don't have enough depth inside of who we are. And hellos are the best way to actually truly see that the American dream isn't three lanes wide. It's a million lanes wide. And you're always that one hello away from seeing the right American dream that you can plug into that changes everything. Hmm. Where'd you learn that? Years and years of getting it wrong. Essentially, uh, because my story started with dads at the park and realizing hello was this one thing that I was not utilizing. Because for me, going, growing up, there was this part of high school where I asked a girl out and she said no. So then I learned that subconsciously that sucked. And so let's avoid that. And so I avoided all human interaction to the most part of like new conversations. And that part of me was the part that was missing. So when I was 30 years old, I'm 38 now, I went into this question that's like, if you want something you've never had, then you need to do something you've never done. And in that mode, I realized I don't have friends. And I was like, okay, I can, I can deal with that. And then I was like, why don't I have friends? Well, I don't say hello. And so then I was at dad's, oh, there was always dads at the park and I wanted to say hello, but I was like, you know what? They just want to have a long day like I did. They just want to play with the kids. They don't want to talk. And then one day I just said, screw it. I'm going to say hello. And we were adult, both just playing chicken. And we turned out that both of us wanted to talk. We just needed someone to go first. And repeating that over and over just taught me how good it felt hearing new perspectives from people that were not part of anything in my life. Like airplanes is the best place because you just get a bunch of different like cornucopia of different people, airports, even grocery stores, just having good conversation with the checkout person or people in the conversations in the grocery store. All of those moments will lead into just a basic more understanding of who you are. And that helped me even step more into who I am today. Like every hello helped me reflect back. And even you mentioned like, why is it important to have deep conversations with people is because there's a part of our humanity that we don't explore enough because we don't say hello enough that people are the mirror for the things that no one ever pointed out that are amazing. And depending on how your life has shown up, you might not actually know what makes you truly amazing. And other people, the right kind of people, the heart centered people, they can reflect back like, man, that was good. Or one of the things that came in my life early on, like, Ben, the way you put words together is not like other people. And I'm like, huh, I've never had that advice before. I wonder what that means. Now I'm a podcaster, speaker, and coach. Like those reflections allowed me to actually become more of my authentic self that I couldn't see on my own. It's like you can't reflect in, inward to see who you truly are. Other people truly need to help be that mirror for you to figure out who you can fully step into. I love hello as the starting point, especially for creating new connections, building friendships, solving that modern isolation issue that now, today, the public zeitgeist is, is really starting to understand um, as we're coming out of, um, you mentioned Corona or COVID uh, through this whole pandemic issue and kind of as we're learning how to reconnect with folks. And a lot of times there's like the courage to make the first step. What is the second step? You've said hello. Now, what do you do? Lead with curiosity. I'm, I didn't realize it, but through conversation, I realized I'm a little bit drunk on curiosity. <laughs> I was always the guy in class asking questions. In college, I was the guy that asked a question two minutes before class got out. 
because I wanted to know. I, my mind is always actively being curious, like, huh, why, well, why did that happen that way? Or how does that work? And now I'm cursed with my son doing the same thing. And it semi drives me nuts, but I also lean into it because I know how important it is. But that curiosity is how you can begin to explore how did they learn to see the world that way? And in conversation, I always bias. It's difficult because sometimes the ego can take it away and you can kind of like, I want to say how, how what I know about different things. But I always try to lean into that. I want to learn how they learn to see the world that way. For real estate people that see the world like one million dollar asset at a time. How did you learn to see the world that way? If you even on even more like uh, dangerous topics of like pol politics and different things, how did you learn to see the world that way? And through curiosity of learning how to understand their world, you then can enhance yours. But then also that person may actually learn to question their own world because most people don't actually explain how they learn to think about things. And often it's our thinking that's really one of the things that hold us back, but we don't actually question our thinking or even in thinking category of like, whose thinking is this? Is it my thinking? Is it passed down like a bad piece of uh, luggage? Or is it something that I uniquely experienced and I came to my own thinking on it? But using curiosity is that second step. Even to jump third, like there's a part, once you realize the word hello is like this universal tool that can change your life with one conversation. If you strategically say hellos towards your big vision, you then can meet people that are living the pathway that you want to get closer towards. And the more you do that, the more you can learn their secrets and they can learn wisdom. And then you can shortcut to get exactly where you want to go. I always talk about like this third part that one of the things that most people don't have is a really big vision that's pulling them. And most people need a gravity sized vision that has a Jupiter sized feel to it, that the gravity will do the work. So if you, it's kind of like the law of attraction, but I like the idea of gravity pulling you towards this thing in the future that's going to change your life. And if you strategically plant your hellos of like, I'm going to go to a real estate conference because my big vision is to be a real estate guy your hellos will then perpetually pull you closer to that vision because you're going to learn how they see the world. And if they can teach you how to see the world that way, then you can get closer to where you want to go. Love it. Love it. How do you, so we kind of, we talked a little bit about the external part and there was a hint at the internal thing. So um, hello is a great way to uh, meet folks on the, uh, on the external cultivate new skills, get into new mindsets. How, how have you been fostering this in your children? And so you, you mentioned that he kind of, uh, your son inherited this a little bit from you. How do you teach the right, the correct way? So it's not why, 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 or the bad side of extreme curiosity. Um, how do you foster, like, how do you channel that? Maximum I would say I'm still in the R&D lab because my oldest daughter is 11 and my youngest is six. But right now, the simplest way is I routinely say hi to people that I don't know. I'm always waving to people and I'm from the Midwest. So like that's already naturally part of our culture. And so I'm always waving to people and my kids ask like, dad, why are you always waving to people? Or my wife doesn't like it, but I'll often honk and wave just to like make people I see you and I notice you. Or even something that I do even at the bus stop every day. I acknowledge every kid waiting at the bus stop and I give them a hello when I say good morning and how are you type of thing sometimes. Or I just have conversation with them. And I want to normalize conversation. I want to normalize being curious. I want to normalize when you see a friend maybe hurting, go over and be a good friend. I wouldn't say there's a right way or wrong way, except the, the thinking that the, the principle I go back to is we normalize what we normalize. And if I want to normalize conversation, if I want my kids to feel naturally okay to talking to other people, because there is a, an extreme of this where if you're a protective parent, talking to people could be strangers and they're going to kidnap your kids. I balance that at the same time. And where we live isn't necessarily a high risk for that happening. But I'm always demonstrating a friendliness to society, a friendliness to say hello to people, to talk to people in the, in the line. Kids think it's annoying but I want to normalize it as something that's okay. And they're going to more is caught than taught. So they're going to pick up more of what I do than what I say. So as long as I'm modeling it and even something that they see me do now and they call it speeching like dad, are you speeching today? And I've done it at their school and I've spoken in front of their elementary kids on veterans day. 
And even those moments where I step in front of a bunch of people that seems intimidating, I'm showing them that interacting with words in society is good. Most people are afraid of this interaction because of the toxicity that can happen in conversation and letting their own BS kind of get in the way of a conversation or even learning how to get through a conversation that doesn't become toxic. There is that part of society that makes it fearful, but I want to model that like most people are good and most people will have a great conversation with you. There may be a dud, but you'll learn. And the more you learn, the better you know. I love this. I love this sort of framework around developing charisma. And I love the pulling from something you said earlier about really being interested in the other people and really figuring out how they think and work. So you also mentioned that there's an internal thought process to it. It's like almost like you're saying hello to your thoughts. Can you walk uh, feel good fathers through not only how to have a really great external charisma, but also how to determine, as you mentioned, are these my thoughts? Are these inherited thoughts? Is this bad luggage? Is it good luggage? Is this actually what I think? What's, how does that look? And how do you cultivate that in your children as well? This one's tricky, especially within the kids. But there's a part of kind of just your own heartbeat. If you think of it from the basic heartbeat idea that... I always have this mantra that I always want to be the lowest heartbeat in the room as a parent, as an adult, that to be fully grown up and adult like is to be cool, calm and collective, no matter what happens in life. Easier said than done. But knowing that one of the most powerful lens that you can look through your own inner issues with is your responses. So the one primary responsibility you have for your kids is to model healthy responses. One of the greatest lies ever told is that we're responsible for our kids. And if we're responsible for our kids and everything they do is our fault. And that never actually allows them to fully grow up because the consequences of life do the teaching. And if you accept responsibility for them, you take responsibility from them. So going backwards to that response. So as long as I'm going back to health, modeling healthy responses, that a stimuli comes in, what's my natural response? Can I stay calm even though my kids are shouting? Can I say backwards and say, hey, I don't appreciate the way you're talking to me and say it cool, calm, collective without raising my tone. Using this lens of your responses then allows you to go inward and be like, why am I angry? Why did I allow a two-year-old to upset me? Like the ridiculousness that a two-year-old has the power to push an adult to lose it is a little bit crazy, even though it happens. And even I've been there. But that idea of analyzing your responses allows you to go inward. It's like this first breadcrumb to analyze where did that response come from? And even going one more step inward, the th part to kind of analyze is, and this is how you identify the baggage and the thinking, your brain is very lazy. When moments happen in front of you, it doesn't figure out like, ooh, we got a new moment. Let's reinvent the wheel. It always just Googles your brain and says, have we been here before? The moment it finds a record, it just copies and pastes it. You got about three seconds before it just pastes it in there. Slowing all that process down, and if you have a response, it's like, whoa, where did that really horrible response come from? Then you have to ask, like, where did that thought come from? And this is where you can kind of get lost in your childhood, whether it would be an adult that said something or like a high school girl for me that said no, or in sixth grade where two bullies punched me right before I walked into high school or into high or uh, middle school history class and essentially took my voice away for six years that I didn't feel I had permission to actually vocalize pain in my life because I didn't have the courage to report them. And I just sat in class outwinded and frustrated and sad, and I did not have permission. Like these moments is where those responses come from. Or one that's still kind of rears his ugly head on me is sophomore year baseball. I sat on the bench the entire season. I played two innings out of 98. And that year taught me that everybody else gets to play in the field of life except me. I'm always going to see life through a chain link fence which then limited what I would do. That thinking was corrupting every decision that I can't be like that. Even podcasting. I used to say like, Ben, guys like you don't do podcasts. And I had to really dive into where did that thought come from? And it all kind of came back from that baseball. So if you think of your responses and going and kind of searching, like where did that response come from? Because it came from somewhere. And it was most likely a duplicate of something either in your youth, in your early on, or a trauma that happened. Or even in some cases, there's parts of getting really deep inside 
that I always like to describe your your brain like a house. And a, a fully alive human being has all the lights on. But early in life, when you're ki- as a kid, you're wired to survive. You're wired to stay alive psychologically. So if you learned that expressing feelings or crying or any type of you being you was met with ferocity of like, whoo, man, that triggered my uh, flight response there and I'm going to fly away. Your brain learned to turn these circuits off. And when you turn those circuits off, it doesn't even know how to process sometimes the response is coming in because half your house is off or you just know don't go in that room then because last time you did, your dad hit you with the belt. Those parts also kind of go back into because that's kind of going back to where your responses are coming from and is your response calm? Is your response loving? Like you need the full house in order to have a good, healthy responses that they're coming from. Mm. You're hinting a little bit at how with like leading from the front and, and creating space for everybody about how you would cultivate the full house um, in your children. Um, you also have, um, you have an interesting perspective on legacy. Like while we're talking about your family, while we're talking about your children and this whole responsive piece. Um, can you let us know uh, a little bit, catch us up on the off-air conversation we had about this and then uh, cue this up for Feel Good Fathers? So the one thing that we often never think about is legacy. And often because we don't have a vision, we don't ever really think about what we're leaving behind. And I'll even go to the extreme of like the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is that your kids are at your funeral, your friends are at your funeral, and your friends share a story with your kids that is ones that your kids are like, man, why didn't my dad share that story with me? It's amazing. I would have loved to have heard that. That's like the worst case scenario. Your kids should already know who you are when you're alive. And most dads don't intentionally spend time explaining who they are, how they've lived, why they've lived, what are the things that they've learned to avoid, and passing that down, that generational knowledge to them. And in many ways, because they don't have that connection, kids and even kids in my generation at the at 38, we still don't necessarily have a strong connection to our father to go get wisdom from. There was an interesting story that I kind of created or a tool for military dads who were leaving away that when they're gone for months at a time, I would tell them before you leave, create a spot, create a memory that's like an anchor memory, like fishing, biking, a place that they can go visit and have a conversation with dad. That there's this safe place that they can go visit and ask you hard questions. And when you're gone, whether you're deployed or whether you've passed away, this will be a sacred place that they can go connect with dad. And this is part of your legacy. Like your legacy isn't what you do here on this earth. It's what you leave behind. And once you have kids, they are the best chance for you to impact future generations. That if you truly want to impact 100, 200 years from now, your kids and the human beings that they become are the best chance that you have. What you do here, like I said, is important. You're not just going to drop the ball and stop being you. But there is a point where you have to switch to who your kids are becoming And are you leaving the best parts of your family behind? And even in the military, everybody would always focus on their service as their legacy. And even as a veteran, they would focus on what did my service mean? All these different hard questions that don't have good answers. Then it was irrelevant. Your legacy is your family. And understanding and switching your priorities, switching your mindsets, and knowing even where I am today, I'm at at home dad doing a lot of different things, but I prioritized being at home because I knew when I was 50, I was going to want this time back with my kids. And between zero and 10 is the time everybody wants back. And if I don't prioritize this, this is going to be the time where I'm solidifying relationships that I have when they're 20. And I knew it was going to be dividends that were going to leave me down the road. And we don't think about this within our career planning. We don't think about it in our transition planning. We're just so drunk on work. And ultimately, I've kind of summed it up in this. Most men are taught how to make a living, not actually how to live. And It's our responsibility to help our kids understand how to live with their uniqueness and figure out how to enter the world with that uniqueness and expand it and be the person who they wanted to be. That living opponent is not something men are universally taught. It's not what we're rewarded on. It's not what's been passed on. And it's that luggage that we need to do. But most men still have that leave it to be for I've done my job. I come home, I read the paper and I wait for dinner. There's so much more to get juice out of that squeeze for that orange and that's the stuff that creates that legacy that 
200 years from now, people are going to talk about how you lived because you passed it on. Mm. I love that when we combine the entire picture of anchor memories, uh, something that's coming in the extended interview. So go ahead and go check that out when it's ready. Um, and some other and saying hello and creating this charisma and leading from the front and being really curity, uh, inquisitive and, and having a high degree of curi curiosity. I, I love this because it, it implies that um, when we're in it and when we're in in the hard years or when things aren't great, um, that vision you're talking about, that legacy, that long term element, uh, really, when we think about like Viktor Frankl. It's like if you've got a big why, if you have a big destination, if you're walking towards that large mountain that's on the horizon and you're taking steps every single day, it makes the challenging parts tolerable. It makes it, it what it really makes is the lack of a skill or the lack of a perspective or the lack of information. It makes it worth pursuing that for the investment. Um, something that um, isn't talked a lot in this space is about the fulfillment or about, uh, it can be called fulfillment, but what do you as a father in your estimation feel when you're moving towards this legacy idea? I feel grounded and there's a kind of an, even a simpler distinction to your kids that you can even look through. Are you adding O2 to the furnace or are you adding CO2? That especially for men and young boys, their father can be the O2 that roars that furnace to life, that they go into the world with this true hard identity of they know exactly who they are. They know how to attack ferociously. They know how to be a lion, but also a very calm tiger. And that part of the, like just the masculine identity can come from the, are you the O2 or the CO2? And there is a simple lesson that's almost too simple to actually believe it's true, but it's psychologically backed up and the data shows that I also do a youth training from 10 to 14 year olds to help parents help work through adolescent drug abuse and saying no when kids at peer pressure. And one of the most simplistic things that they do to teach kids of this is how you actually get where you want to go and avoid peer pressure is they tie it all back to if you have a goal as a kid, at the 10 to 14, you have to question, is this choice getting me closer? Like for example, if you want to be a pilot, if you get a felony, you're out. And simply having these things that they're going to lose that they truly want, they're most likely going to make better decisions. And like, it's the simplest thing. They have a goal, they make better decisions. If they have something to look forward to, they make better decisions. Even the calendar, if I put something that's fun on the calendar, they talk about it for weeks and they just focus on it. They get excited about it. And it's this uniqueness of... Even this other way to say it is our kids don't necessarily learn who they are by 12 years in school. They learn who they are by getting outside of their life and seeing it from the outside looking in. They see it from traveling. They see it from other people living different lives than they do, and they understand the world with a wider lens. And we may not be able to exactly help our kids know exactly what they're wanting to do, but it's our responsibility to help create an environment where that idea can exist, it can grow, it's nurtured and encouraged and rewarded when it needs to be. Um, because there's lots of things that happen in life. But at the end of the day, we're responsible for creating a condition where happiness can exist. We're not responsible for their happiness. Kids can have sad days and it's okay they have sad days. But being that lowest heartbeat, doing this inner work where you're the calm person in the room, where there's also this sense, if you bring it back to that word home I brought up, that most men think a home is a mortgage they pay once a month. Home is a place that you find on the inside that then begin to radiate on the outside that makes it actually feel like a home. Many homes decorated with HDTV to the wall still end in divorce and still have dumpster fires for relationships and their kids. It's because you need to come home first on the inside. And by doing that, then you can create, you can radiate this calmness that allows you to calm your daughter at five who's crying by simply just sitting there and not saying a word and rubbing her back. Or the idea that your son will call you up and saying, dad, we watched a movie today in school and a dog died and I'm really sad and I can't fall asleep. And he's crying over at bedtime. Calling me in to have that conversation, to talk about it, by talking about it and he felt better about it and he went to sleep. Had I not had a relationship with my kids, had I not been able to be calm, 
they wouldn't have invited into me that. And it's these little emotions that stack up, whether it be a cat die, a dog die, an issue at school, a playground issue, those little emotions stack up. That's what creates kids rebellion is they've got all this pent up emotion. They don't actually know what's going on anymore. They don't feel safe telling you because early in life you demonstrated your response was unhealthy and even tying it something that I always repeat in this story is early in life, your kids tested you, whether you were there for the little things. And when it's the big things, they'll remember. And what you're preparing for is the moment they're at a party when they don't feel safe. You want them to trust your response. And if your response is a fir- burning down the house with anger, yelling, frustration, punishment, you are not going to be the first call. And you might actually get the call that you've never wanted. Your responses are conditioning their response and how they can come to you, whether it be a car accident, a party, dad, I don't know what I'm doing. We just got married and I'm two years in and I think it's not going to work out. All of this is tied back to your response. It's all tied back to that place you bring from the inside and why it's so important because it's your legacy. If you, fatherhood doesn't just end at 18. It's this lifelong journey as long as you're here on this earth and you can be this person for your kids that allow them to come to And that is the wisdom that they can pull from. But if your responses aren't healthy, you're not creating that symbiotic relationship that can change their life forever and be that O2 forever on their days where maybe the world snuffed it out a little bit. You can be that person that they remember helping them remind themselves of who they are. I love that. Um, The perspective on responsibility and the respect, respect perspective on if you really want to be a responsible person and you really want to own everything that's going on in your life, it, it really is all about owning yourself and, and building everything that's around you, starting with uh, you and starting with managing your, your inner game, starting with managing um, the way that you think about things. And as you've, you've said a whole bunch of times, starting with how you respond to things. Um, what is... What was your path learning this? How was your relationship with your father? Um, what was sort of the legacy you think, uh, just to kind of stick with this conversation that he left behind? How did this, how did this kind of weave in for you? It was based on a legacy of work. So I grew up on a farm here in southeastern Wisconsin where work is how it's defined. And it's been defined that way for a hundred years. My grandfather lived on a farm. My dad took over that farm. I grew up in the same house that my dad grew up in. And it was all about the farm. Part of my story also was like, I never felt connected to the farm. I never felt like that was my calling. But it's also like, I'm the only son. So you have this like inner shooting of like, oh, I should be the son that takes over the farm. And I had to work through that. But also my dad's advice was, you just get a job, keep your head down and wait for retirement. There wasn't anything about that that was exciting. And it was almost this blueprint of not to ask more from life. Like it was set the bar here. And if you can hold it there, you're good. Once you meet other people on the other side of hello, you realize like, wow, there's like past level 10. There's experiences that you can't even imagine. And kind of what broke me, but also then I got reinstalled. When I went to in the Marine Corps right after high school, I was there for in the Marine Corps for four years, but I got stationed in Okinawa. I first family to have a passport, first family to travel overseas. And that kind of broke me to how wide the world really was. I went to Korea, stared down the North Koreans, the DMZ, went to the Philippines, Australia. And that perspective taught me like, there's just so much more here and I'm questioning everything. On the way out, the Marine Corps gives you this basic plan that says, go to school, get a job, start a family, American dream shows up and happy unicorns. 10 years into that, I was an empty shell of this wasn't working out. I dropped out of school. I was following what I thought was this thing that I was supposed to. And it all came ahead when I was 30 with really dark thoughts. Like even going back to legacy, Jay Leno had just left the tonight show and all these people came out to thank him. And I'm like, when it's the end of my life, I don't think a single person is going to care that I was here. What I'm doing now has no significance anywhere. And it was this dark feeling that felt like an alien attack ship sitting over on top of the city. And it's like, how do you move that? It came down to how lows. That was the virus that took down the alien attack ships. And kind of redefining through conversation, through finding other dads on this journey and masterminds, I found out who I was, how I could become that, what I had wrong, questioned my own thinking. I mean, this is still like a seven-year journey. So it's not easy, but it's worthy because 
ultimately there's a question that happened when I was 30 that I remember looking in my daughter's eyes, who was like two years old at the time. And it's like, how am I expected to take you into your life if I can't even do it for myself? It's like, who am I to do this if I can't even do it for myself? And that humbling moment is where I'm like, there's got to be a better way. And that's where that question, if I want something I've never had, I need to do something I've never done, which gives you the option to question like, it's not that you've tried everything. You most likely have not, guarantee it. It's what result have I been getting and what have I never done to get that? And finding things that I've never done, because if you've never done it, now you're getting somewhere. And if you can keep doing that kind of example, you'll get to the point where you question how you got there and even what you hold on to and some of your identity attached to it and realize like there's a whole nother world of me, even tying it to this coaching metaphor I learned last year. There was this part of a deep question in my soul that I didn't believe that the real me mattered, that my life hadn't shown up in a way that the authentic version of me mattered. Very few people spent time to understand me. I spent more time trying to be like them and then losing myself in the process. When I first read that in a book, it hit me like a bag of bricks because it flips it. It says, the real you does matter. Do you know what book that was? The Badass Counseling Method. No, I'm sorry. It's a Badass Counseling Method, but there's a hole in my love cup by Sven Erlingsson. He kicks, he does it in a really great way and essentially helps you realize that like the reason why all the things you live in your life, there's a hole in your love cup, whatever's poured into it pours out the bottom. And he dives into this really gut-wrenching soul stuff, why your soul speaks in the way it does. What's that whisper from your soul? And the part that like, that, that once you start stepping towards the real you, there's a second part that kind of comes with it. Did you learn that the real you was good or bad? And as I step more into the real authentic me, I realized it's both. The real me matters and it's good. Stepping fully into that belief allows you to have a, a stronger shield towards what comes at you. It has a more grounding effect in your responses because it doesn't need something from the outside world to make you feel good. You realize I am good. The real me does matter. It's not broken. It's not something damaged. It's this is me. And that's where you kind of get to this lowest heartbeat in the room where the outside world is just a bunch of physics unfolding. It shouldn't upset you. It does because of what came in at some point in your life and got stuck. And when moments happen in front of you, it triggers that stuff and it comes up and triggers your response. Once you work through all of that, that flow of energy is becomes a flow and best advice from frozen that still is if you dive into Eastern meditation, letting it go when that hits it is still the best advice that once you feel that, that chest come up, that response, like just say, let it go. Like that's the energy trying to release it when it gets triggered. It's not meant to be pushed back down and just keep repeating that process is how you get to that spot of calmness. Layer in, layering in this sense of peace, you said lower, lowest heart rate. We've talked a lot about the family. We've talked a lot about your children leading from the front, imparting these experiences, creating space for them to be themselves. We've now capstone that with how do you, like, what does that look like for yourself? Let's talk about, I think, that next big thing. What is this concept of deep friendship that you talk about? There is a part that we've left behind in the last 100 years, and it really kind of transitioned when we started going into factories, that we were never really wired to do life alone. Prior to factories, it was all together. Families were together. The tribes were together. If you go further back before we started like colonizing, there was always people. There was always a sense of community. There was always a sense of, it does take a village to do this. Like, that's a joke, but I dive into it multiple times where it takes a village to raise a family. It takes a village to figure out who you are. And when you realize that there was this primal part of being connected to a community that we've now let go, there is a part that when you do get connected to healthy, capable men that are also heart-centered, that are doing this, that aren't necessarily like, you should just man up and, and not talk about your feelings. When you get talk, connected to the right kind of people, you realize this new feeling comes into like, you know what, I can do this because they're with me. I'm no longer by myself. And 
it's that deep rooted feeling that we are alone, that truth that we often buy way too often, which leads to the suicide rate among men, that I'm the only one in the universe feeling this way because we don't talk about our feelings. And then when you realize that we're all playing chicken again, it all kind of comes back to that same moment. It comes back to, are we doing it in a way that allows us to be connected to something? And every time I've been among a group, whether it be in a retreat, whether it be in an online Zoom, when men are sharing the hard truths of life, when they're going first and sharing like, man, I don't know how I'm going to do it today. Other men learn. And a part of this deep connection, I learned this from watching NCIS during Corona, or I re-binged all the episodes during Corona. And there was an episode where Gibbs was trying to help a Marine sniper. And the Marine sniper was trying to protect his daughter from his issues. And the therapist that was trying to help them both told Gibbs, you need to understand, Gibbs, one man's story is another man's window in a room without one. And Gibbs' story, as healing through his trauma, is going to help this guy heal through his trauma. And you realize even storytelling is this hidden thing or a modality of healing. And when you realize your story is like everyone's story, or even if you're a man of faith, the more you realize that your story is tied to the original story of Jesus, and you find these threads of even like Jesus said, build your home on a rock and a foundation. I translate that to, you need to have a strong house feeling on the inside. You need to be grounded. It needs to feel like home on the inside. And that radiates on the outside. When you realize it's all connected, you get tapped into a feeling that you can do anything. And it's not about like what life gives me today. It's about, I got a guy for that. I know who I can call if I'm having a bad day in that. That component right there. That is what we get wrong every day. It's one of the simplest things that you can do to change it, whether it be saying hi to dads when you're picking up your kids. There's moments all over to connect with other people. Or if you have a family, like our school's doing a color run here in a few weeks. There's a bunch of dads. Say hello, connect, find out similarities. I have many dad friends that have changed my life over and over that come from just saying random hellos at gymnastics, the park. Like Those conversations teach you to connect they teach you that this is what you're missing. And once you have it, then you can do anything. And I've been feeling, I don't know why I've been feeling it, but it's been coming up some of the conversations, but diving into this quote from the Bible, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for he is with me. You can translate that to God is with you in that moment that you truly aren't alone. You can also translate it to that there is someone actually by my side, walking with me side by side, and I had to rewire my friend definition because I've also, within this process, I realized I was a codependent and I had a lot of uncertainty, which is a whole nother rabbit hole. But the part that I learned as a friend was a good friend is not, I'm there for you. A good friend is I'm there with you. And I can be among the very few people that can be near you, even when you're not okay and have no desire to change you. And that I know by being calm and present, I can become a calming presence for you. And by being calming present for you, that's your most highest place of influence. Again, it's not what you're going to say. It's how people are going to feel around you that's going to change people. And as a person who does this for a living, that's part of something you almost have to let go. Like you have to stop letting your ego say smart things and just know that sometimes you just need to be calm and present with people and not say a single word, which is what your kids often need. They don't need you to say or give a lecture. They really just need you to be with them in the sadness. Let them feel it because emotions are meant to be felt and understood, not suppressed. They flow through you, not get stuck. And then they go back. Like there's moments where you have kids where they melt down and two minutes later, they're back to normal. You could have lost your cool on them and created a horrible day for the rest of the date. But it also just went away and now they're back to normal. It's all going back to that calm and presence, lowest heartbeat. But there's a lot of inner work to get there. But it is worthy because this is the trauma that you pass on if you don't. And these are the things and how life works and their responses growing up as well. Absolutely love it. Ben, my man, I think we've hit everything we want to. Um, thanks for coming on. If Feel Good Fathers want to find you, figure out what you're about, where can they find you? BenCloy.com is the place to find me. And if legacy and vision was something you struggle with, there is a button in the right-hand corner to book a free design your legacy call where we'll, I have an exercise that I walk people through to kind of get out of the rut that they're in to actually see what is already inside. You just don't have the framework to see it. 
and we dive into it and then potentially see how we can actually make it happen. Ben, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Jay, for having the time with me today.